Hello and welcome to this portion of the science track for Con Carolina's virtual convention. My name is Jim Craig and today we're going to talk about doing some astrophotography with some things you probably already have at home. You don't need an expensive telescope. All you need is a decent camera, a tripod, and a few other little bits and bobs. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background. My, as I said, my name is Jim Craig. I am an astronomy educator. I worked in planetariums for more than 20 years. Uh, I've also taught college astronomy. And now I am working with my own production company, Planet of Mystery Productions, where we produce planetarium shows and video for museums and planetariums the world around. Also do some other bits of hardware work for them. But before we get to started, we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to make a picture. Anybody who can run a camera can do astrophotography. It takes a little bit to do good astrophotography. So we're going to talk about hardware, software, and everything you need, some of which you probably already have. Now my recommendation is to use a DSLR, Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. Now this is an old one, probably about 10 years old. It's a Canon EOS Rebel XS. And it works pretty well. I've been pretty happy with it over the years. I've taken family vacation pictures with it. Also done some astrophotography with it. This is not the stock lens. Uh, it's a zoom lens. Although I only have it set to 75 millimeters, I don't want to zoom in any more using the techniques we're about to talk about. You can also use the stock lens that comes with it. This is the standard stock uh, zoom lens. I think it does like 35 millimeter. It does 18 millimeter to 55 millimeter. The other lens does 55 millimeter to 250 millimeter. So it can zoom in pretty well. That lens is actually pretty good for taking pictures of the moon. But you definitely, I recommend a DSLR because you're going to have more control over it than you are over another kind of camera. You can try this with another camera because all you're going to do is just be spending some time, not spending any money. So experiment. You cannot, you can't fail. You may not have a great success, but at least you're not going to break anything. I also have to say you've got to have a camera that's on a tripod. It's got to be very steady because if you have ever noticed when you take a picture of a light, if you move your camera at all, you get a streak. And what we're going for here are nice pinpoints of light not streaks of light. You also need a remote, some way of triggering the camera without actually touching the camera. Now, modern cameras, you know, the new DSLRs, you're going to find that they can be controlled by a phone or they have an infrared remote. Uh, whatever method you use, if you can, find one that lets you set in advance how many pictures you're going to take. Otherwise, you're going to stand and do what I did because I have an old fashioned remote it just every time I push the button it takes a picture so for what I'm about to show you I had to push the button 105 times just to take the pictures but it plugs in camera doesn't move since that time I've gotten a little smarter and discovered that my camera came with some software that lets me control the camera remotely using a USB cable this is standard uh, I guess it's the mini USB rather than the micro USB Plug this into the computer, plug this into the camera, run the software, and let it do all of the work. Uh, somebody taught me once, or told me once, work hard or work smart. And of course, you're going to need a computer. Currently, smartphones, as smart as they are, and they are definitely a whole lot better than the first computers I use, but they don't have the capability to do what I'm going to show you today. Also, if you can, have a computer that's got a fair clock speed. Uh, if it's got multi-cores, all the better. The more powerful your computer, the faster this process is going to be. So let's take a look at what it is we're going to get and what we want to turn it into. So we're going to start with our before image. This is a raw picture taken with this camera I just showed you. It's uh, in the constellation Orion. You see the three stars that mark Orion's belt. And then down in sort of diagonal to the left, you see uh, Orion's sword and in the middle of that you can see what looks like a pair of stars. They're fairly close together. There's a whole lot more going on there. So using some processing and the tools I'm about to show you, this is what we turn it into. Now you can see a whole lot more stars, a nice black sky and some nebulosity. That's the uh, Orion Nebula M42 and that was captured with nothing more than a DSLR and a 75 millimeter setting on the lens. So this is actually not that difficult to do. 
But before you do, you're going to have to get your camera set up. <coughs> um, you first, set your camera mode into manual. On my camera, that is the letter M. Let's see if we can get yeah, letter M right there. Set it to manual. Your exposure time, two seconds. If you set it longer than that, and that's what I use is two seconds. If you set it longer than that, what you're going to find is that you get a little bit of streaking. Now, the best way to figure out how long you can set your camera for is to take your focal length. In my case, it was 75 millimeters and divide that into 300. It turns out to be two. Some say you can go five, or divide it into 500. I find that you still get a little bit of a streak there. So if you're, say, for example, using a 50 millimeter lens, you can go up to four seconds. It just depends on uh, the focal length of your lens. Of course, if you're using 50 millimeter, you're not going to get that nebula like I just showed you. You want your focal length to be set between 55 and 75 millimeters. Anything more than that, you're going to wind up with streaking. Anything less than that, you're going to wind up with a, just your field of view just a little bit too wide. Now, if you will try and take pictures of the Milky Way galaxy, that's fine. I would actually be doing a lesson on that right now, except we're not looking at any clear skies for the next two weeks. That's something else you need. Clear, dark skies, and I don't have clear or dark right now. On your aperture setting, you want to open as wide as possible. Uh, currently, this camera, it's set to f4.0. If you can get wider than that, all the better, because you want to try to gather as much light as possible. You are collecting photons, and you want to get as many of those photons as you can to get the sensor of your camera. Now, picture quality, you want to set your picture quality to the best quality. On my camera, that is set to what's called a raw image. It'll save it as a .cr2 file. The raw images, which the software can handle, are uncompressed, so you don't get any compression artifacts and nothing like that. It's just the image as the camera took it. Now, some cameras will let you do raw and the CR2 or, uh, and JPEG, and that's fine because you can do some stuff with some JPEG, Im JPEG images. The biggest problem with the JPEG images, as I said, there's always going to be compression artifacts. You can't get rid of them. It's just the nature of the beast. <clears throat> One thing to do is sometimes when you take a picture, your camera display will light up and show you the picture you just took. That's called the review function. Turn that off. That review function causes your uh, little screen here to light up. That generates heat, and heat is picked up in the camera as noise. We're going to talk a little bit about noise in a moment. Also, the display, when you have your camera turned on, you're going to get the display function like this. And for my camera, it's just really easy. There's a button that says display. Turn that off. You don't want to see it. Again, when this display is on, it's giving off noise. It's giving off heat. And the sensor inside the camera can pick that up. I'm going to turn that off now. So now we're ready to start taking pictures. Um, first, you're going to want to take what's called a flat. And that is set your camera to the focus. Then put either a t-shirt or a handkerchief, something white in front, and take a moderate exposure. You want it to just be sort of a nice even gray. And what you're doing is you're taking pictures of all of the flaws inside your camera. Dust, uh, vignetting, because sometimes the sensor will, sometimes the sensor doesn't work really well all the way out to the edge. So you get sort of a vignetting around it. You want to record that because you want the software to take that out. Sadly, when I took my pictures, I forgot to take flats. My bad. But take about eight or so of those. <clears throat> then you want to take what are called darks. And that is your camera set at the proper setting. It's two seconds. Everything identical to the way you're going to shoot it. You want to take it into a dark area. Same temperatures you're going to shoot. And just take eight pictures. Of nothing but that those images will show something then you want to take what are called bias photos and that is you set your you set your exposure time as fast as you can and take about eight pictures your camera has electronic noise built into it and you can actually find that electronic noise and filter it out 
if you take those bias frames. And again, lens cap on, fastest setting you can. Then you set your camera to the settings you wanted to take your regular pictures at, put it on your tripod, aim it to a part of the sky you want to take a picture of, and start snapping pictures. Minimum 100. I've actually seen this done with as many as 400 pictures. And the one with 400 pictures was even better than what I'm going to show you today. So now we're going to go into some software here. So we're gonna go into screen capture here. And this is uh, actually in GIMP software because I wanted to show you, this is one of those darks. This is a close up of it. And you can kind of see a little bit of a red dot there, a little blue dot, maybe a white dot. Let's zoom in. That red dot's becoming more visible. You can also start seeing some background noise there. That red dot, that's a pixel in my camera that is stuck. Nothing I can do will make that pixel not be red. But my software will compensate for it. But you'll see red pixels... Okay, you see a blue one. I think I saw one that was white earlier. But you also see just a lot of just junk here. Let's zoom way in. See all of that? That's noise. That's my camera picking up heat. It's uh, just problems with the sensor itself. And you can compensate for that. So now we're going to go into our next piece of software called Deep Sky Stacker. So I've already got that fired up here. And this is Deep Sky Stacker. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask you to open picture files, dark files, flat files. I have never taken a dark flat file and bias files. Now, when you get your images from your camera, I recommend putting them into directories with those names that you have picture files, or as I call them, lights, dark files, darks, flats, and bias. That way you can set up your software. You can just go straight to those directories, no confusion. So first let's open some picture files. And these are raw files. And I'm going to pick one and then hit control A. That selects all of them. And it just imported 105 pictures. Now, if you click on this to see what it looks like, it's not going to look like much of anything you might be able to make out the three stars of Orion's belt there, but you're not going to see much. If you look in up over here in this little display in the top left, yep, that's the star. Not a whole lot to look at, but you can actually see it's a fairly decent shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to check all of those. That way it'll process all of them. And next we're going to want our dark files. Again, I've got that here in darks. And I'm actually going to pick, let's see, I got 16 of those. Let's pick all 16. Those you don't want to look at. Is that, no, I might have. Okay, I do have some flats. Um, these I took of a wall here in my house. Um, let's just pick eight of those. And finally, bias files. I'm going to pick the first eight of those. And you don't have to take more than that. When I was first doing this, I thought I'd take a huge amount. I took over 200 bias files, only to find out that I didn't need that many. So now we're set. So first we're going to hit registered check pictures. And one of the first things you want to do is make sure you've got enough stars visible. So you see here where it says compute the number of detected stars. Just click that. It'll do a quick check. There are at least 21 stars. You want at least 10 visible stars for this to line up on because what the software does is it looks for those stars and it makes sure that they line up. It will find like one star and line it up on the similar star from the next image and do the same through all 105 stars. Under recommended settings, I got that all set to go. I do not know how to do this thing with the black point to improve calibration or any of that other stuff, but we're good there. In stacking parameters, what I do is I tell it to go standard mode. Under my light files, I tell it to do uh, Kappa Sigma clipping. I don't know what it means, but it does a very nice job. Under dark, I've got Kappa Sigma, sigma uh, bias alignment. OK, 
Okay, on alignment, I tell it to do bicubic alignment. Under output, I can click here and tell it where I want it to go. So it can actually tell me to do an output folder, all that sort of thing, but you tell it to create an output file. I don't need a description file. So we are good to go there. So now we're just gonna click OK. Now this takes a long time, so I'm going to pause the recording, and when it finishes, we'll come back. Oh, did it say OK? Well, that took about seven minutes, and I'm pretty sure you didn't want to sit through seven minutes of my computer processing, but you can see now we have a whole lot more going on in this picture. You can see the three stars of Orion's belt. We can actually bring that up a little bit, just temporarily just to take a look at it by bringing up the mid-tone and hitting apply. And you can see the trees in the foreground, they're a little bit blurred, but that's not what we're after. What we're after is right here. So we're going to go into the software GIMP, that stands for the New Image Manipulation Program, right up here in top left. Hit File, Open, and what we need to do is find where we told it to save. We told it, I told it to save in CAA Talk, or CAAC Talk. Images to process, and it's going to be autosave 001.tiff. That's the picture we just created. And there it is. Again, not much to look at. I'm going to hit 1. And there's those three stars of Orion's belt. And you can see, let's zoom way in. Those are nice and round. That's what we're going for, is nice round stars. And then down here, that's where we saw that nebulosity earlier. Again, not much to see here. What we need to do is we need to do what's called stretching the contrast. So what we're gonna do is come up here to colors and click on levels. And you see this little spike over here, that's where all of our data is hiding, is in there. So what we wanna do is we wanna coax that out so we're just going to pull this over a little bit. You can already see there's a big change. However, it's also now a lot more gray. So what we'll do is we'll hit that, then we're going to do it again. But this time we're going to bring up the darkness. Make it dark. And simultaneously bring up some light. And you just keep doing this back and forth, and this is a blend of art and science. There's no real formula for doing this, just whatever looks right to you. I'm just going to hit that. I want to select that. We're just going to zoom in. And you can see a whole lot more going on there. So what I do next is I can get rid of that background. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to crop because I don't want all of this stuff. I mean, yeah, it's kind of nice. And when I crop, what I generally tend to do is try, I try to crop a size that is about the same size as a, an output I'm going to use. So say, say, for example, I wanted it for my desktop. I'd go, I think it's 2560 by, go away. Had some soft, I uh, had some email come in. That's a fair crop. So now what we do is just come up here to image, crop to selection, and that is now our whole image. Hold Control Shift A to get rid of our crop line, and hit plus to zoom in. And now what you'll notice is our background. It's kind of, it's lighter here or darker here and lighter here. What we're going to do is we're going to make a gradient. So we're going to start by using our little eyedropper key or uh, our eyedropper tool here. First, we're going to tell it to set the background color. And the background color is going to be over here in the dark. So let's just click way up here in the top right. That'll be our background color. Then set foreground color. And we're going to do that right here in the bottom left. 
So now what we want to do is we want to subtract all of that. The only way to do that is to get a layer and make it a subtraction layer. So click down here on the layer palette, make a new layer. Under mode, there are a whole lot of different modes. We want subtract. We want it transparent for now because we don't want it to subtract anything. We're going to make sure it's the same size as our main image. Then we're going to come up here. We're going to right click and pick gradient and also hit G. And we're just going to draw a gradient across here. And then hit enter. And now we've got that nice image like we were looking for earlier. So we're going to merge down that layer. And now we're going to play a little bit again. Now that we've done that, we're going to colors, go to levels, and we can play with that a little bit again. And you can just keep doing this. Now you can overdo it. You can always tell when an image is overprocessed. See, we still have some gradient in there. I don't like this. Hit Control Z, undo it. But there are different, you know, a lot of different ways you can do this. We're going to, this is the one that I did earlier, just to do a comparison. I've worked on this one for a long time to get the image to come out just like that. But it worked really well. Again, it's something you can play with. I have the feeling that this summer with uh, the Milky Way coming up, the Milky Way has the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula really visible in it. Way up overhead, you have the North American Nebula. I'd be willing to bet that experimenting with this method, you should be able to get that sort of thing. So give it a try. It takes a little bit of time, takes a bit of effort, but in the long run, you're rewarded with some really nice pictures like this. If you have any questions or comments, by all means, please leave them for me and I'll try to comment as much as I can. Again, my name is Jim Craig with Planet of Mystery Productions. I'd like to thank you for joining me for this virtual lesson in astrophotography. So get out there. If nothing else, just take a look and enjoy the night skies.